Welcome to this video and thank you for watching. This video is about how we anticipate that we need to intubate patients within our respiratory ED. We have worked closely with our ITU colleagues and tried to come up with a single plan which is going to be used in terms of how we approach these patients. The respiratory ED resus has been set up within the last three to four days, so there are things that are going to change and this video will need to be adapted at some point. But for now, I hope this gives you and everybody who's going to be working in this area a clear idea of how these patients are going to be intubated. For the interests of preserving our PPE stocks, we are not using full aerosol generating procedure PPE in this video. We are using a training version of it. In the video, I've tried to break the video down into small chunks so that there are easy to understand sections. I've tried to edit this video for clarity and to make the different steps in the process clear, but I do apologize for the audio quality, which uh, does chop and change a little bit throughout the video. The first thing I wanted to talk about was how we receive the pre-alert. This will have significantly changed having split our ED into two an ED and a respiratory ED, and hopefully the, the following flowchart makes this a little bit more of a simple process to understand. For all patients who are directed towards the respiratory ED, there is another step, and early on we need to be considering whether these patients are going to undergo an aerosol generating procedure and appropriately escalates to the correct team. The team that we're creating is a team that's going to work ideally within ED itself and we're going to call that the ED respiratory team. This is a team that is now set up at switchboard and by dialing 4444 you can ask for the ED respiratory team and this will send out a bleep cascade and all members of the team will have a bleep on them. It's important to note that currently this team does not include intensive care and so if you want an airway doctor to attend as well you'll need to additionally bleep them and also as things potentially change we may be thinking about asking for the, the cardiac arrest team from the adult hospital to join as well. If the patient is a patient with suspected COVID or is COVID positive but has undergone trauma or is an obstetric patient the relevant teams will need to be asked for as appropriate. I have tried to simplify the medical pre-alert form that we currently use. The following form has got all the same aspects but in a slightly different order to how it was and early on trying to identify whether this is a potential patient that we should be managing on the respiratory ward. All other aspects are in keeping and when you get to the end of the uh, front page, if the patient is a respiratory patient, then the onus is to turn over and make sure that the second half of the form is completed. The first part of the page on the second page is to be completed by the call taker. This highlights which teams have been activated and there is an area to sign for this. The second half of the page is to be completed by the ED clinical senior lead. The first area is to take responsibility for the team's PPE and make sure that everyone is wearing appropriate PPE. The next box is to be completed when the patient has arrived. This is designed so that a rapid assessment is made and a whole team decision is made about the appropriateness of escalation of the patient. There is a clear area for documentation of the team's decision. Is this a patient who needs immediate intensive care support and an intubation within the respiratory ED recess? Is this a patient who would be for escalation to intensive care but doesn't currently need it? Or is this a patient who we feel wouldn't benefit from intensive care and a DNAR decision should be made? We are using a shared checklist with our ICU colleagues to intubate patients who might be suffering from coronavirus. The first part of the checklist is a checklist that needs to be completed outside of the room. Now I view currently that this is going to work best if the ED senior team leader is responsible for making sure that this part of the checklist is done and as you will see later the rest of the checklist is to be completed by the team who are inside the room. I think it is important that we have a clear handover of leadership which again I will detail later but there is an area on this document to record this. So in our example, the teams have been called and they're starting to don their PPE in the designated PPE donning room just outside respiratory ED resus. 
The code for the room is 1234. As you enter the room on the left, there's going to be an area set up for flu PPE. And on the right, you should find everything you need to don PPE appropriate for undertaking an aerosol generated procedure. On the wall, there's also going to be a laminated card with what the current appropriate PPE is. So you can always refer to this as a guide for how to don this. After PPE has been donned, we propose using a permanent marker and writing each other's names clearly on the aprons and potentially rolls as well. This will help with communication in what is going to be a ch more challenging environment than what we are usually used to. The team is going to consist of one ED doctor, one ITU doctor and two ED nurses. They will all be wearing full aerosol generating PPE. Further to that, there will be an ED team leader and a runner who will be in flu PPE and will remain outside the resuscitation room. With PPE donned and checked, the team members are going to move into the resus area. The team leader will then check that everyone fully understands their roles and the team will start to prepare to receive the patient. As I mentioned earlier, there is an outside the room part of the checklist and this details the drugs and equipment and time to discuss the airway plan prior to the patient arrival. For ease, the dressings trolleys are going to be stored in each of the recess bays, so all you need to do is collect these and take the equipment that you need from the bank of equipment as found in the recess trolleys. So this is how we envisage the airway trolley to be set up. In an ideal world, we're going to get a photo of this, which is going to be laminated so that the airway assistant just has to match the items to the picture. Let's talk about the um, circuit as we've got it here. So we have got a water circuit, which is going to be plugged in at the wall on one of the Christmas tree valves. We've then got the end tidal filtering line, which is upstream of the HME filter. And the standard catheter mount, which we are all used to, is being replaced with this inline suction catheter mount. So you just need to attach that. Below that, for the patient arrival, we'll be attaching a mask. And that is all the kit that we're going to be passing in on the intubation trolley. And on our procedures trolley for this patient, we're anticipating intubation. So we've got the intubation pack here, which has got details of what is inside it here. And then we've got the drugs which have actually been drawn up and ready for intubation here. On the procedures trolley, again, you have a second shelf. For our immediate priorities, we've got two different packs for cannulation. So as we receive the patient from SCAS, it's going to be the ET, ED senior team leader's responsibility to make sure that the patient is coming in to the respiratory ED head first. The two members of the SCAS team who will be in their appropriate PPE will come into the room and bring the patient up level with the trolley. The trolley has been moved over in the room uh, to make space for this. The two members of the SCAS team with the, the sheet that the patient will be on will roll the sheet, pat slide the patient, roll the patient and with the assistance of one doctor and one nurse in full PPE the patient will be transferred onto the bed. The pat slide will then be pulled out put in, and remain in the room for it to be cleaned and the SCAS team will remove their trolley uh, and that can be uh, cleaned outside the room. The idea here, whilst the team are undergoing their assessment, um, getting the monitoring on, getting IV access, and doing what we routinely do with the patient, uh, is that the ED senior is outside the room in the clean area, along with the assistant runner, who is in flu PPE. At this point, decision is going to need to be made rapidly by the ED senior, be that the registrar or the consultant, whether this patient is a patient who is for palliation and DNAR, for ward-based care, which will then lead to a discussion about DNAR status, or whether this patient is going straight to intensive care and requiring an aerosol generating procedure, i.e. intubation immediately whilst they're in our respiratory ED. In this example, the patient does require an immediate intubation. 
It is my role as the ED team leader to make sure that the outside the room part of the checklist has been completed satisfactorily. There may be scenarios where this cannot be achieved, but it is still my role to make sure that this part of the checklist is completed. There is then going to be a clear transition of leadership, and at this point I'm stepping back from leadership and handing over to the ED senior in the room. The doors are going to be closed because of the aerosol generating procedure that is the intubation, um, and this is going to help to protect staff outside the room as well. We will then continue to watch from behind the door to provide further assistance if further equipment is needed. The inside the room checklist will then be completed by the ED team leader. There will be checklists to hand, but there are also going to be checklists inside each room blown up so you can use a, a checklist on the wall. The checklist details things such as patient positioning, monitoring, uh, checking that IV access is established and checked, and where the suction is. There will be whiteboard paper in the rooms with dry wipe markers and I suggest that all drugs get written up for clear communication, both in terms of the milligrams or micrograms being given and also the mills to be pushed. Therefore, this will be as clear as possible to the entire team. The team should then discuss their approach to plan A, B, C and D, as there are changes to how we would usually do a routine intubation within our resus department. At every step, we are fundamentally trying to reduce any aerosolization. When the team is happy, all induction drugs will be pushed and these will be pushed one after the other with a generous flush. The airway doctor will maintain two-handed mask technique to reduce the chance of any aerosolization. When the patient is suitably anesthetized and paralyzed, the, the airway doctor can begin their first attempt. A McGrath video laryngoscope should be used for first line as long as the intubator is comfortable with using it. If it seems that the first look is not going to plan, the ED team leader who is now outside the room and not leading will take a front of neck access pack out of the airway trolley, open the door a minimum amount and throw this into the room. The intubating team should continue with their plan as discussed but these patients are potentially going to desaturate quickly and there needs to be a real team effort in not stalling at any stage in the intubation plan. In our example, intubation is main managed successfully on the second attempt. We've used a bougie, but a stylet is also acceptable preloaded in the ET tube. The bougie is removed as normal and there is a prioritization of getting the circuit connected quickly. When the circuit with HME filter is attached, the cuff of the ET tube will be inflated. It is only after this that the first breath should be given to the patient and all of these steps are designed to try and minimalize aerosolization into the room. When entidal is confirmed, then the tube can be secured as normal. With regard to ventilation, we have designed a pre-made pack which will be hung on the side of the airway trolley. This pack includes the ventilator circuit, forceps and gauze. And the reasons for this will become apparent in a second. It is important to highlight that there is only one Schrader valve in each of the ED respiratory resource bays currently, and this has got the oxygen flow meters attached. Therefore, a second oxygen source must be in the room for the ventilator to be attached to. In time, we are trying to get bulk oxygen to be put into the room for a second Schrader valve port. The anticipated ventilator settings should be pre-programmed prior to turning it on. The aim is to have the ventilator on in the room but not connected to the patient for the minimum amount of time, again to try and reduce the amount of the aerosolized particles are moved around the room. The uh, team leader will continue with their checklist and go through this uh, process, which we'll demonstrate for you now. Turn down the flow to the water circuit. Always clamp the ET tube before breaking the circuit. So can we clamp that but with uh, gauze around the clamp? Is it clamped? Yes. Disconnect the water circuit from the capnography and connect to the ventilator.
check the ventilator settings. Ventilator on, unclamp the ET tube and commence ventilation. A decision will then need to be made by the team about who is going to take this patient to intensive care to hand over the patient. The suggestion currently is that these team members remain in PPE and transfer the patient immediately following acceptance from ITU and confirmation of a bed space being available. Any team member or members who aren't needed will come to the area that is the doffing area which is the area where you're going to take off your PPE and put it in the bin as provided. Remain to have your mask on, clean your hands in here. This is for patient linen and then leave the room. The mask will then be taken off once you leave the room. And when outside the room, you will wash your hands in the RNA section of respiratory ED. After an aerosol generating procedure has been performed in these recess boot rooms, they need 40 minutes prior to being deep cleaned for any virus particles to settle. We've arranged a cleaning sign for each of the doors and it is down to the team to make sure that this is clear for the cleaners and for staff who will be wishing to use the room next. The idea with the system that we have is that kit is stored in the bank and that as you need it, you put it onto the dressing trolleys, which gives you the flexibility to use different rooms to work around this cleaning schedule. Following this, all the drugs that have been used must be prescribed on EPR and all of the actions need to be documented into the notes which will remain on EPR as per normal. Thank you very much for watching and bearing with us whilst we go through this quick transition to creating a respiratory ED. Everyone's hard work is greatly received and everyone is doing an incredible job. Feedback on these videos is going to be really useful and I hope to get many more educational videos out to you all soon. Thanks for watching.